What person in history was Jamie Fraser based on? And are the medical practices Claire uses truly accurate? Pearl Clutchers, this is for you. Here's what Outlander gets wrong, and all it gets right, too. So after you found out Jamie survived the Battle of Culloden, you might have been skeptical. Showrunner spent the entirety of the first two seasons convincing you that if Jamie and Claire failed to stop the Jacobite Rebellion, it would mean the end of their romance. Never mind that everyone knew there was a third season coming. Jamie's survival isn't actually all that unusual, especially when you consider that there was a real person who survived the Battle of Culloden in much the same way. According to Parade, author Diana Gabaldon based Jamie's character on a Jacobite officer who survived the battle along with 18 other wounded officers. Just like the fictional Jamie, the officer was called Fraser, and he narrowly escaped execution after he was discovered hiding in a farmhouse with the other men. That's pretty much where the similarities end, though. Sadly, history does not remember how old or dashingly handsome the real officer Fraser was, or whether he was married to a time-traveling World War II combat nurse. But hey, anything's possible. After the Battle of Culloden, Jamie hides in a cave, puts on some kind of weird floppy French beret thingy, and slowly transforms into the Dunbonnet which is kind of somewhere between a Geico caveman and a bohemian folk musician. This, too, actually happened. According to Radio Times, the Dunbonnet was a Jacobite soldier who hid out in a cave for seven lonely years following the Battle of Culloden. The locals fed him and named him after his hat so none of the local British troops would know what they were gossiping about. Not only was the Dunbonnet a real person, but they kind of sort of know where his cave was. Or at least they know of a cave that could pass for the Dunbonnet's cave well enough that they can charge people admission to see it. Oh, and also the identity of the real Dunbonnet is known. He was the chief of the Fraser clan, and his name was Jamie Fraser. No kidding. My own sister! Put him in the irons! How could you? This is your own fault. You brought this on yourself. Outlander includes some other real people, too, though liberties have been taken with things like relationships and who got along with whom. Jamie's grandfather in the show is Lord Lovett of the 45, also known as the Old Fox who, in reality, probably did not have a grandson named Jamie. According to The Scotsman, the show did a pretty good job portraying Lord Lovett as history remembers him. Just like in the show, the historical Lovett was loyal mostly to himself, so loyal that he sent his own son into the service of Charles Stewart and the Jacobites rather than putting himself in harm's way. According to writer Catherine Curzon, the real old fox was executed by the British for his support of the Jacobite cause and was actually the last person to be beheaded in Britain. It makes sense because his execution did not go at all the way that the British wanted it to. For a start, Lord Lovett wasn't distressed or remorseful during his execution. In fact, just before the executioner did his work, a huge crowd of onlookers tried to climb the scaffolding and it collapsed under their weight, killing 20 people and sending Lovett into fits of hysterical laughter. The accident didn't save him, but it might have made the British think twice about the wisdom of public beheadings. Historical fiction doesn't always do the best job with costumes, mostly because modern viewers prefer costumes that are elaborate and low-cut. Let's take for example the costumes in History's Vikings, which were essentially a cross between leather biker wear and a post-apocalyptic steampunk Mad Max. For the most part, the costume designs in Outlander are much more historically accurate, with a couple of notable exceptions. A lot of viewers have complained that Claire doesn't dress in a strictly 18th century style, but that's by design. According to the Scotsman, in 18th century Scotland, women wore embroidered dresses and tight corsets, and costume designers did stick to that baseline. Claire isn't an 18th century woman, though, and since clothing in those days had to be tailored for each individual, you wouldn't really expect Claire to adopt a strictly 18th century style. Instead, her outfits are just a little quirky, just a bit modern. Big, bold floral patterns weren't really a thing in 18th century France. But let's not forget that combat nurses from the mid-20th century weren't really a thing either. Won't this kill him? No, but the pressure on his brain will if I don't release it. There's some controversy about exactly how the whole tartan thing came to be, and if it was even a big deal in 18th century Scotland. According to Elle, costume designer Terry Dresbach says she figured she'd be getting angry letters no matter what she did. So she just went down the path that made the most sense to her. She chose to dress the Frasers in a dull, grayish tartan because she figured that brilliantly colored dyes were probably hard to come by in the damp, cold Scottish highlands, and may have even been too expensive for most ordinary Scots. She even thought this through to a granular level. She asked herself what dye-making materials would be easiest to obtain in that part of Scotland and then designed everyone's kilts under the assumption that everyone in the neighborhood would have been using those dyes. In other words, not only is there a method to the Outlander kilt design, 
but it's kind of possible that the costume designers got it right. In Scotland in the 18th century, people probably wouldn't have spoken a lot of English. For a start, the language of the time was Scots Gaelic, and there really wouldn't have been any reason to speak any other language unless you were in the presence of people who couldn't speak Gaelic. In the show, the Scots characters do speak Gaelic, but they don't seem to speak it a lot. This is both for Claire's benefit and for the audience's, since there would have to be subtitles, and traditionally there's only so much subtitling that the average American can tolerate. Also, despite the fact that there were plenty of Scottish actors on the show, only one actor knew more than a word or two of Gaelic. And ironically, it was Claire herself. According to the Glasgow Times, everyone else had to take a five-week crash course in Gaelic, led by a coach who did not let any of them get away with so much as an incorrect inflection. This means the Gaelic you hear on the show is accurate both in word and accent. And in case you're wondering, it's not subtitled because showrunners wanted the audience to experience Gaelic the way Claire does, like lovely but totally nonsensical linguistic music. In the 11th episode of season 1, Claire gets tried for witchcraft because, as everyone who has ever watched a period drama knows, hundreds of years ago women who had healing skills, at times, got tried as witches. Anyway, it's the 1740s, and Claire saves a boy from poisoning by doing what any 20th century nurse would do. She gives him an antidote. This doesn't go over well with the village priest, who was trying to perform an exorcism on the poor kid. It makes for exciting television, but it's not historically accurate. Witchcraft trials were not happening anymore by the 1740s. In fact, writer Diana Gabaldon even told National Geographic that she was fully aware the last witch trial in Scotland happened 20 years before Claire's arrival, but she went ahead and put one in the story anyway. Her reasoning? Who's to say that there wasn't a witch trial somewhere in Scotland that people just forgot to write down? Outlander is so universally appealing that even the Journal of the Medical Library Association wanted to get in on the action. In 2020, they published a paper entitled Claire Fraser, RN, MD, OMG. If you don't have a medical background, you've probably wondered just how accurate all the medical practices are in the show. Does raw honey really work as an antibiotic ointment? Can you sterilize surgical tools with whiskey? Well, according to the author of the 2020 paper, not only are both of those things totally plausible, but so are most of the rest of Claire's 18th century versions of 20th century medicine. The one exception is the penicillin she makes out of Roquefort cheese. Although Roquefort does contain a mold that is related to penicillin, you couldn't use it to make actual penicillin. The author of the Journal of the Medical Library Association paper doesn't say how useful the resulting product might actually be, other than just noting that it couldn't hurt. Other critics have been less generous about it. Fancited, for example, commented that the way Claire was growing the mold was all wrong because it should have been done in the open air rather than under jars. Evidently, this is a detail that Diana Gabaldon raised with showrunners, but they went ahead and used jars anyway. Sure, he was called Bonnie Prince Charlie, and everyone knows Bonnie is a girl's name and also the word Scots use to complement feminine beauty. He must therefore have been weak and ineffective, right? Not so fast. The prince's reputation as a weakling originated in 18th century propaganda, so you have to take most remembrances about the personalities of monarchs with a grain of salt, especially when they're monarchs that ended up on the losing side. The 1745 Association, which is a group of historians specifically interested in the Jacobite period, called the portrayal of the prince in Outlander, quote, a hangover from the 18th century. According to modern research, Prince Charles was an active participant in the Jacobite cause. He marched with his army over sometimes difficult terrain and enjoyed broad support in Scotland, which would have been difficult to muster if he spent most of his time just sitting around looking bonny. On the other hand, it's true that bonny Prince Charlie wasn't a very effective leader. According to IGN, this was a hard pill for actor Sam Hewen, who played Jamie, to swallow. In Scotland, the prince is romanticized as a national hero, but the show could have portrayed this side of the prince without using the very outdated and offensive trope that effeminate equals ineffective. Tell me, what are the state of affairs in Scotland? In the show, Jamie and Claire eventually end up in 18th century North Carolina. According to The National, both Lowland and Highland Scots really did settle in the area around Wilmington and Cape Fear, North Carolina, during that time period. Some of them may have even been Jacobites, as evidenced by the fact that British loyalists accused the Scott governor of North Carolina of encouraging former Jacobites to move to the area. In the fourth and fifth seasons of Outlander, the audience is introduced to the Regulators, which you may remember as the settlers who opposed British authority and overtaxation. In the show, one of their leaders is Murtaugh Fraser, Jamie's godfather and former Jacobite. 
In reality, the regulators were sometimes accused of being Jacobites, but probably weren't. Also, most of the regulators were Scots-Irish, not Highlanders. Still, Scots did play a part in the American Revolution. But the National says that most of the Jacobites were probably fighting for the British. Surprising, considering that those were the folks they'd fought against at Culloden. Almost no Hollywood production featuring white colonial protagonists has managed to not screw up their portrayal of people of color. Outlander, sadly, is not an exception. In Season 4, we meet the Fraser's indigenous neighbors, and stereotypes ensue. As far as accuracy goes, well, Outlander does get one thing right. European colonists showed up and took over native lands. Yeah, that happened. Also, none of the actors playing indigenous characters were Cherokee or Mohawk, the two groups depicted. Though, to be fair, that's hardly the fault of showrunners. According to Town & Country, Actors' Guild rules barred them from hiring Americans, and no one is as American as indigenous Americans. Still, they were able to hire Canadian First Nation actors instead. To their credit, they did also make an effort to get costumes right, although there's only so much they could have done given that not much was written down about what the Mohawks and the Cherokee were wearing back in the mid-1700s. A lot of the indigenous costumes you see on the show are based on guesswork, which means there's no way to know for sure if they're accurate. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite things are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.